So, if you don't mind, could you please uh, tell the audience uh, who you are and what organization you are representing today? Sure. Um, my pleasure to join you here at B-SPAN. My name is Misha Robinson, and I am the founder and chief executive of HOPE of I Am We Are. I Am We Are is a youth empowerment organization that strives to give youth the tools that they need to confidently own their future. Um, I'm from the D.C. metropolitan area. I was born and raised in Germantown, Maryland, attended University of Maryland Eastern Shore for my undergraduate studies and New York University for my graduate studies. Um, and my background before doing this work was really in the marketing and strategy space. Okay. Um, and you, you, you were talking about your schooling. Um, what did you actually go to school for? So my undergraduate studies were in business administration and my graduate studies were in marketing. Okay. Um, and could you, could you please uh, tell us, could you, could you let us know your journey from how you were able to, you, you went into marketing, and how you ended up with this organization right here. Yeah, so I definitely just, to all, anybody out here who's listening, watching, um, for those people that are like the wanderers, I'm your person, <laughs> so that took the path, let's travel by, or decided to get off the traditional path. So I um, always wanted to travel, and so I think my story probably starts back in undergraduate studies. Um, I wanted to travel. I grew up in this area and took African dance classes. And I also was in a tap dance company and my instructor was French. And so we used to perform at the French embassy a lot. And so that's where my desire and interest in traveling and particularly to the continent, just based on sort of the very um, sort of pan-African community I was growing up in. Um, and so in undergrad, um, I had looked up on the wall and I saw a, a thing for semester at sea and I saw a thing for Peace Corps and I didn't know about either one of them I saw a semester on sea TV on TV they had done like a real world episode on it but I was like okay let me send away for this I knew I wanted to get my MBA but I needed something to do in the interim um, and so I decided to do Peace Corps after I got the materials and the literature for it and mind you my first airplane trip was um my junior year, I went to Chicago for an internship for like a week during spring break. And my first international trip was my senior year of um, my undergraduate study. So to now be like, I'm going to go live in West Africa. I ended up living in Benin was like definitely completely sort of on the other side of the world for me and very different. Um, I took a job straight out of undergrad. Um, living down in Atlanta as a way to kind of test myself to see if I could live away from home and be okay. Um, I always joke that the only thing sort of comparable between those two experiences, though, in reality, was that they both were hot and, and there was a lot of black people in Atlanta and Africa. But so, so, so right. So when you moved down to Atlanta, <clears throat> when you moved down to Atlanta, um, well, first I wanted to, to talk to you about your. Uh, first time flying. You say your first time ever flying? First time ever in an airplane was my junior year of college. When you went to Chicago? Went to Chicago. Okay, so that, that's a huge jump from Chicago to West Africa. Yep, so I, I think my senior year, um, I actually took out a student loan, so I had opportunities to travel to Paris and when I was in high school, I had an opportunity to go to a Caribbean island, uh, to Martinique, um, in my freshman or senior, sophomore year of school, and I didn't have the money. Um, and so I took out, there was an opportunity, there was a fashion merchandising program to go to London and to go to Paris. I took out a student loan to be able to go because I was determined, like, I was not going to let another opportunity to travel pass me by. And, like, um, my three goals coming out of high school were to travel to Paris, travel to Africa, just any country, and to live in New York City. And so... I was not going to let this last this opportunity to travel to Paris pass me again. And so once I got to Paris after that being my dream and seeing London, I was like, if Paris is this cool, I have to see the rest of the world. And that really kind of leapfrogged sort of my whole travel experience um, and kind of got me on that path of wanting to be able to do Peace Corps. Um, so from there, I, I served in and I signed up to serve in Benin, West Africa. In, in, in the Peace Corps. In the Peace Corps. Okay. Could, could you could you break down to people how a person is able to get into the Peace Corps? Like, what what are, what are the, the steps? 
to get into the Peace Corps? So it's changed because I did Peace Corps like 15 years ago now, but I can still actually, um, I, I currently work for the National Peace Corps Association, so I do have some familiarity with the new process. But um, uh, it's, it's an application first and foremost, so you do have to have um, an undergraduate degree. Um, and now it's really competitive, like the, to get in, it's almost as competitive as getting into an Ivy League school. Um, so you do need to have some sort of experience in the area that you're applying. So now when you apply, they actually let you pick the country and pick the program. When I did it, you just applied and then they wrote you back and said, here, there's a position in this country to do this. And so I, I had asked to work in a business capacity. And then I also wanted to go to a Francophone country because I really wanted to work on my French. Um, and so, and I specifically was like, I need to go to Africa. Like I, I was very like with my recruiter, I was like, if you send me to Eastern Europe, I am not going. <laughs> I did not want to be cold and in the snow. I was like, I do not want to go to, I, I want to go to Africa. Do not send me to South America. Do not send me to Asia. Um, so there is an interview that takes place after that. They also do like a psychological assessment and a medical assessment. And if you do medical, if you pass medical clearance, then you get to go. Um, and you'd go through three months of training in country before then um, swearing in to do two months of service at your post. Okay, and, and talk about the training. What what type of training are you doing? So it, it, in some, so one you like when you so there's no core to the Peace Corps is what I always tell people, and the only time you kind of really have that core experience is when you're traveling to the country and when you're in country for the training so you know we they you're in a city for staging for two days to kind of do the initial orientation and then they kind of just let you get on the plane and go <laughs> and you're in this group and then you get to the country and so you're you're with people you come in as a group like a cohort um so in my group we came in with business volunteers health volunteers and then also um environmental volunteers so we were a large group of probably like 60 or 70 of us and then you split off by program so all the business people went to one city all the environmental people went to one and the health people went to one and so then once we split off into that group there were probably about i'm going 20 30 of us maybe uh, i think i'm overestimating that that like 20 let's go with that that all were in business and then we stayed in the same town for these three months and we went to classes every day um so you stay with a host family first and foremost to kind of learn culture food etc and then you're going through technical training, like how to teach classes and be a facilitator. Um, and also learning about sort of that, you know, we were teaching, I worked with um, local cooperatives and taught them very basic marketing and accounting skills. And so you're learning how to do these cahiers or like notebooks to the ledgers, that, that's the English word for it. Um, but then in addition to that, you're also learning sort of life skills, like how to go into a market and buy fruit and how to know what's bad and what's good. like. I don't know, to, you know, to pick a pineapple, did you know that you pull out the little things at the top and you can smell it and that's how you know if a pineapple is good or not? Or how to negotiate. So in Benin, you have to negotiate all the time to buy things. So you learn how to negotiate. You learn, we did have motorcycle taxis. So we literally had one day all these motorcycle taxis come up and you learn how to call them over. You learn how to negotiate the price, like things of like how to get on the bike without burning your leg on the muffler and things like that. So they're taking you through these skills so you can live on your own. Um, and then after the three months, you literally are dropped off at your post and you're by yourself and your core to your core Peace Corps experience is gone and you're kind of on your own for two years. Now, now when you say <clears throat> by yourself, do you mean by yourself or, or you're with no, a group of people? by yourself. You live, you have your own house. Um, you have a counterpart. So um, like I was working with the organization called Seal Cam, which was a credit union. So I had a boss at that organization that I work with. And my job was to, you know, especially when I first started, I would go there every day and I had co-workers um but you're by yourself so you're and depending on your post and um what you asked for i requested and said i wanted to be in an area with other volunteers but some people were in the north of the country and it took them like maybe you know a couple hour motorcycle a couple hour taxi ride in order to see another volunteer i had one other volunteer in my town and then i had three other volunteers that were about like a 30 minute motorcycle ride away um but other than that, like, but I'm still living on my own. You have your own life. You pay your own bills. You figure out what you're going to do on a daily basis, et cetera. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> no problem. And what was your, what was your core mission? 
So um, my primary assignment was to work with CL Cam. They had a problem with uh, people defaulting on their loans. And so the thinking was if we could get them to have better business practices and have an understanding of sort of the fundamentals of business, like just because you did something, you, you, you sold something, you have money in your account, doesn't mean you actually turned a profit and understanding the difference between like profit and revenue. Um, so things like that and how to have better marketing principles. So I would teach these classes and consult these businesses on better business practices. Um, in addition to that, then we also have secondary projects. So mm -hmm. I worked with local, um, uh, they called them um, group months or women cooperatives to be able to help them with the same thing. So I, w I was in a very sort of like regional capital. I wanted to go work with people that were in a more rural area because like for instance one of the guys I was working with was like a pharmacist and I was like well I didn't come all the way this guy's got more education than I do like I mean he did need the skills but I mean you know I wanted to meet with people that really needed it so I um worked with um, some cooperatives that were in villages nearby where I was um and then the third project I well actually I don't know, a third project I worked on was working with junior achievement which teaches entrepreneurship to kids so I started business clubs in two of the local schools um and then i also ran the women in development program for my region okay and the the women in development program <coughs> what, what were you concentrating on in that particular we have you um do like mentor mentee relationships between local women and um young girls and just really helping them to have a better helping them with life skills and we would organize conferences where we would bring these women together with the young girls across the region to be able to have dialogue and conversation and and how long were you on that particular mission so the so you're there for two years. two years and so i think the thing you know because you are on your own and there's like really like i mean you're managing not just your life but your job and you're sort of like a consultant in some regards to these organizations it takes a while to kind of get started and when i went to benin i didn't even really speak french so <clears throat> not only and i remember my um <clears throat> excuse me my counterpart coming to our training and halfway through and him in him telling me you need to learn French before you get here because I need you to teach classes and I was like oh, okay um <clears throat> so and that's the other thing you didn't train you're taking like French classes so uh the first couple months you're just adjusting to life like in a whole another country and sort of you got to get people to get to trust you and know who you are get to learn some of the players um so you it takes a little while like three three months maybe to get adjusted then you start doing the work and then really they always say like after year one you've kind of hit your stride you have a better understanding of what the needs of the community are they know you they trust you people are now coming to you and asking for work um and then the second year is really where you kind of like psh, you hit the ground running and you're able to make a much bigger impact Right, and and uh, I'm gonna go back to Atlanta because okay, so when you were in Atlanta, that was your first time being on your own. My first time living outside of the state of Maryland, and living by myself, except for like you know college. Yes. Right. So how long were you doing that? I was in Atlanta for a year, and and that's when I worked on my Peace Corps application while I was down there and did all of that. Right. So about a year, mm -hmm. you were in Atlanta, and that was your first time being. By yourself. Mm -hmm. Then from Atlanta, you went to West Africa. To Benin, West Africa. So it's right next to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and how was how, I? I, trying, I want to try to. How was that transition? How how was that? experience like were, were you overwhelmed were, were oh yeah yeah I mean <clears throat> I have to say like you know even though I was joking earlier about Atlanta not maybe not being as good of a testing ground as I thought it was it actually in some regards I think I had more culture shock moving to Atlanta than I did moving to Benin I mean I didn't realize just how culturally different the south was from Maryland especially considering you know as Maryland we're not New York we're not Atlanta we're this mid-Atlantic state so I I, would, uh, I didn't think it'd be like I remember having mentees in Atlanta and not being able to understand them like what did you like like what did you say like are we speaking the same language like because their accents were so thick um but I would say so that did help me in sort of that adjustment um more than I give it credit for but but then I think for me as somebody who grew up sort of very pro-black like I was in full African kente cloth, et cetera, clothes every day going to school. I was literally at Seneca Valley High School, like eating the bean pies, reading the final. I was that girl, um, you know, out of something like a, a, I forget the comic, the comic book name right now, but um, 
Uh, I think for me as somebody who grew up very proud, I think at first when I got there, I didn't have this like Alex Haley roots experience that everybody kind of talks about like, oh, I'm in the motherland, yes. And that kind of shocked me more. And I think it was such a huge adjustment of like, no, I'm not here for a week. I'm here for two years and this is my life. And I'll never forget when we first got to our training site and I had to use the bathroom and how freaked out I was by like this hole in the ground. <laughs> And I remember like Elise Young, she, she lives here in DC, and her her having to like literally teach me and be like, okay, so you're gonna squat over the toilet like this and you need to do that. And I just was so, fr I was freaked out by everything. I was freaked out, honestly, in some regards, by what people look like, by the clothes, by the food, by like, I have to use this owl house thing every day. There's roaches and like, just the, I, everything was just, I was so like, overwhelmed and I think it really just at the end of the day I, as an adult now and somebody who has now traveled at least I think like to 45 countries so yay at this point now um I I'm, I realized it was just because I wasn't I hadn't been in enough diverse environments to really know what that adjustment was going to be like I didn't even really know anybody who had done Peace Corps so I didn't have conversations with people to be able to really be prepared right. so I was just freaked out right. and I think the other thing that I wasn't ready for was the fact of like I finally made it to Africa and to the quote unquote maybe like motherland even if that wasn't language I used and I'm a minority so I went over in this organization where now I'm a minority within a minority within a minority and so I'm still tackling these issues of being a black America black American in Africa okay and, and <clears throat> that, that's good can, can you speak on that as far as uh, being in the Peace Corps and uh, I guess how many minorities are in the Peace Corps or, or do, do, do you have any type of uh, information about that I mean I don't know the numbers exactly and I would say like the Peace Corps has done really has made um, a lot of efforts to be able to increase the enrollment um, of people of color. So whether that's, you know, they partner with HBCUs or they also partner with the historically black um, fraternity sororities, um, they really have a focus on increasing the diversity, but we under index. So we are not in doing Peace Corps at the same amount, of, like it's not an equal representation in the, like the U.S. population. So I think in my cohort, just from I'd say overall, what I think I said it was like, there were 150 of us volunteers in country. There were probably, I could probably count on two hands, the people of color, the people of color in general in, that, in the country. Like we all, we could get together in one house, like and <laughs> have a quick little seven person, eight person meeting. Gotcha. If that makes sense. Um, um, right, okay. Um, and, and, and talk more about the, the people in that particular country um, and were they very at first were they very um, receiving of you um, were they very helpful to you um, did they want did, did they want to know more about your culture than you want wanted to know about their culture I mean I think I, I think the g generosity um, in South Africa there's a word called Ubuntu um, which really is sort of humanity it's it's cooperate human connection, cooperation, sort of this connective tissue that says you're my brother, I'm your sister, even if we just met. And I, that's what I've experienced not only in Benin, but in all of my travels in Africa and even probably in most of my non-Western societies that I've traveled to. So, I mean, yes, open arms, you know, I, I remember even like I had a freak out in my when I was in training about, again, about the toilets, because the toilet situation is a real thing. I still to this day <laughs> have issues, but like um, I... The cockroach crawled up my leg or something using the owl house. And I was like, but there's a flush toilet inside, please. Can I use it? And it was interesting because like culturally the father was the only person and maybe the mother, but the father and the mother were the only people that used the flush toilet in the house. So, um, you know, I asked and they let me do it and I had to get my like um, French teacher to help me have that conversation. But no, I mean, so little small things like that of making those allowances, like nobody else in the house uses this flush toilet, but they let me do it as a visitor to the home. So definitely the whole two years I was there um, and I was even there for 9-11, like open arms to everybody, everybody I met, people very curious um, about America and American culture. And I think what we don't realize and, and, you know, even more so today because of the Internet and sort of because of Hollywood, like as an American, no matter what other people may say about sort of 
how we're perceived and America is perceived. Our government may be perceived one way, but us as individuals, and I think people of color get granted a certain little also, in some regards, sometimes good or bad, it works for us um, because people know the history. Like people are curious and they want to know. I mean, hip hop is big and Hollywood is big. So they look at you and they're like, is it true this? And do you know Nicki Minaj? And do you, you know, I know, I know you know that you're like, no, I don't know those people. But, um, you know, so yeah, they definitely interested about American culture. And I definitely also wanted, you know, for instance, Benin is the birthplace of voodoo. Like I didn't know that. And so I got to learn about that. The, the transatlantic slave trade started in Benin. So I got to learn more about that history um and how the slave trade got started um they've got some really interesting monuments in benin um to be able to take people it's called the rue, rue de les esclaves um the slave route and you can do that to see sort of that last passageway i actually was um even there when they did a reconciliation co um, conference to be able to apologize for their role they played in slavery mm -hmm. so um i'm never one of the coolest moments i had my whole two years there was being at that conference and everybody there and it was a full diaspora um, for audience representing a full diaspora and them singing lift every voice and sing so you're in this french speaking country they sing lift every voice the negro um, anthem in english and like it's africans caribbeans black americans and like we're all there in this one place singing this in the place like the slave trade started like it was powerful um so yeah, definitely open arms. And I think that kinship and that camaraderie and that connective tissue was, was there. Okay. Um, so from there, when that, when, when that two years was up, what did you end up doing? Oh, yeah. So we're doing the whole journey. That's right. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, we're still at the beginning, aren't we? So, um, yeah, I was, so I spent the two years in Peace Corps. And I think from that experience, like I went in sort of still, you know, I'm 21 trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And, you know, I had a business degree. And one of the things I noticed there was that like they had, um, again, you're in a, you're in Africa, it's primarily black, but all of that, a lot of the advertisement for alcohol and cigarettes had all white people and like one black person in the ad. And so there was this, or they would do these things where like they would give away cigarettes sort of for free, mm -hmm. or they would have these road shows where you had alcohol companies with people dancing and singing and it's all kids and it's alcohol being promoted. And so for me, and I, I just thought it was very unethical marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also compared that with Coca-Cola, which even back then, you know, they were just, and I think Coca-Cola, you know, was really pioneers when you talk about um marketing really targeted towards um specific demographics right. they had awesome marketing and it was you know culturally relevant and it was specific to the culture and the language and so i compared the, the these experiences and i was like i want to go into marketing i again as a black american i understand the power of sort of those images with the watermelon and the nanny you right. know mammy and things like that and so yeah. i i wanted to play a role especially on the continent of being able to create marketing and create products that were tailored to the communities and to the culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I came back to the States. Um, I came back to DC and I actually ended up being a Beltway Bandit for a little while and going into business development um, for a government contractor. Um, and then from there applied to graduate school um, to get my MBA in marketing. Okay. Um, and so I went to, moved up to New York um, and went to Stern School of Business at NYU lived in Harlem whoop, whoop, before it was super expensive um, but uh, while I was there I like interned at Hasbro Toys um, and I really wanted to kind of go into like you know also coming from I don't know I wanted to just like excel and to me like consumer package good brand management was sort of like this bar of like what where you could go as a marketer like anybody who's the CEO of a fortune 500 company or fortune 100 um, especially in the consumer package good industry, they come through marketing. So that is like the route to be able to be in the C-suite. So um, I, I took that route um, and I my first job um, out of undergrad or out of grad school was at Campbell Soup Company. And I did marketing there. So I've worked on like VA, Prego, right. um, Buffalo chicken dip. So I did Swanson canned chicken. I didn't even know chicken came in a can before that. Um, <laughs> uh, things of that nature. Uh, so I was there for about four and a half years. And, 
you know, I just, I got to a point going back to my Peace Corps experience where you work a lot of hours. And I, I mean, I was making more money than I ever imagined that I would ever make and, and more than a, most of my family members. Mm -hmm. um, I was having these ex really super cool experiences. Again, living a life that I never imagined and just even knew was possible, honestly. I just completely in a whole new world. And I think one, again, that speaks to just even back to my experience in Peace Corps, I didn't have people around me to really coach me through that experience to know how to navigate corporate America. Right. Um, and then I think in addition to that too, I just had this 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 aching feeling of sort of like, I'm doing all this work. Well, or even taking a step back, I turned 30 while I was there and I remember just being like, I've accomplished all my goals. Like going back to that list I told you earlier. So living, living, travel to Paris. I did that. And actually when I was in grad school, I lived in Paris. So I studied abroad at Achasse, um, in Paris. I would live there for like four months. So lived in Paris, check, uh, living at, to travel to Africa. So I actually lived in Africa and I lived in West Africa. And while I was in Benin, I traveled across most of West Africa. So by that point I'd been to like maybe 10 African countries, um, from my and, service. And, and you're about what age? I'm, at that, this is like 30. So this is 30. Okay. I'm assessing that. But by, but I had done most of that by like 26. Wow. So, um, and then my other goal was to live in New York. So when I got my graduate degree, I lived in New York. So I remember turning 30 and talking to somebody. Actually, I went to grad school with Alan Boomer. Um, I still tell him, he doesn't even realize it's like, you haven't played such a role in my life, but, um, him telling me like, if you accomplished all your dreams, you didn't dream big enough. And I also had was, you know, was at that point where it's like you turn 30 and you look around and I was like, I got the degree. I got a good income, blah, 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 blah. And I'm not happy. So what can I do to make myself happier? So I actually went back to Benin um, after a wedding. So I had a wedding to go to Nigeria. I went to a, to Benin to visit. And I remember being on the beach and praying and asking God and being like, so what am I supposed to do? I surrender. I've tried it my way. Tell me what to do. And God said, go on a trip around the world. And I was like, I don't got no money. Like, <laughs> you know, I got this, this good MBA debt. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't go on a trip around the world. I got this new car I just bought. Um, but I decided when I got back that that's what I was going to do. I said I was surrendering. So it's time to listen. That's the, um, and so I, Took this, I got on this path to go on this trip around the world. I ended up getting money from different places. It's a consulting job came um, that allowed me to pay off some stuff. Um, I ended up getting some bonuses and everything from my job. But um, I, when I, I, I ended up, I started going on a trip around the world. But what I ended up doing was like, well, I'm going to have to get a job when I come back and I need something on my resume. I don't want to like somehow just put myself you know, have to start over from the beginning and wasted all this investment I've done in my career. Mm -hmm. So I need something on my resume. So Peace Corps has a program called um, Response, where it's for people that have already done Peace Corps. And it's short term positions like a month to a year. And I had a bunch of friends that had done it. And I was like, all right, well, why don't I do that? And I also felt like, you know, compared to when I'd done Peace Corps the first time, I actually knew more. I felt like, you know, I was so naive and so unexperienced when I did it the first time that now, like, I've, I've, I'm, I'm older, I've lived a life, I've got a degree, I've actually had professional work experience, there's more I can get. Mm -hmm. So um, I applied to a position to work one month in the Virgin Islands um, with a flower cooperative doing marketing. And I ended up working in South Africa for nine months with Special Olympics. Okay, so, so you have to, how, how did it go from being here to end, ending up? Over there. So the position I applied to in the Virgin Islands was taken and they, you know, she, she offered me something else in Guinea. I was like, I don't want to, I even actually said, I don't, don't want to go back to that. I'm not ready. Like, you know, I was like, I'm not want this easy. And I just remember like, you know, Benin and you know, that all that negotiation stuff is tiring and French and, you know, it's like, you got to be a ready. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want to go to a French country. I don't, I was like, this is easy. Like, I don't. Or I don't know, but I was look. She was like, "Well, go look on the website and see if you see anything else." And I saw this position in South Africa. And when as soon as I read it, I was like, "This is it! I got to do this!" Like it just spoke to me, and I just felt myself in it. And even though it was nine months, that was like, "This is what I got to do," and and I got it. And you have to actually like you speak to the organization, mm -hmm. and they interview you, which is a little bit different than the Peace Corps traditional Peace Corps route. And it was just like a great interview. So I was like, what, "All right." What was the the position? So I was the marketing manager um, for a regional conference that Special Olympics Africa was doing. Um, so they were doing it in South Africa, but they were bringing people from the entire um, continent together to do like a um, to pick the 
team for like a Special Olympics version of the World Cup. So um, I was the local representative for Special Olympics in the community. So I lived in the community. I represented Special Olympics and then I was helping them to do the marketing locally, but then also helping them do social media, things like that to promote the event. Um, so, I mean, with that said, like one that, that I ended up not doing the trip around the world. Um, so I only travel, I ended up traveling for two months instead into like 12 countries in that time. Um, but that nine months that I spent in, in South Africa completely, again, changed my trajectory. So remember, I'm like, this is my point in my life where I'm surrendering and I'm listening. Right. And I, as soon as I get to this community, um, one, it's the sister city to Prince George's County. So I'm like, did I really come all the way over to South Africa? Go to people be like, oh, where are you from? Oh, you're from Maryland? Oh, I was just over in Sula and, you know, a couple months ago. Yeah, don't you know such and such? And I was like, this is so weird. Oh, do you know Boo? You know, yeah, Bowie University. And I was like, what? Like, yeah. So it just, it little things like that just were so much confirmation of this is where I need to be. It just felt good. And, you know, my challenges this time were different because... I'm coming from a place where, you know, like I had a cute little convertible and right. I had a cute apart. I had this apartment with this beautiful rooftop deck in Philadelphia, like mm -hmm. in like the hip neighborhood. And, you know, I had this, you know, great job and good income. Right. And now I'm taking public transportation on the side of the road like this. Okay. It's <laughs> it's hot and I'm walking. And I, even to this day, I was at, in my community the um, just this last time and I was sitting with somebody. She's like, hmm used to just be walking over here <laughs> walking I was like I know but like you know I'm walking in the hot sun now places like and right. on the side of the road and I got just enough money if you know I was fine but you know what, I, what about the, the toilet situation how, how I got a flush toilet I'm good I was like yes thank you a flush toilet in an indoor shower I didn't have so when I did Peace Corps I had an outdoor shower and no hot water so yes um and you know it was outside it was beautiful though like imagine taking a shower and I had um, water installs. So I took a shower every day outside, and a lot of most people, Peace Corps volunteers, take bucket showers. So mm -hmm. at least I had it came, it trickled down on me. Um, so yeah, this time I got hot water. <laughs> I got a flush toilet. I live in like a developed area, kind of a developed, you know, rural area. Um, I went to the movie. I went to the mall. Went to the movies every week as my treat if I got through the week. Um, I treated myself and I would go to the movies. So <laughs> what kind of movies were, were they showing? All American movies. Oh, okay. So, I mean, in South Africa, English um, is one of the languages that's spoken there. So I could just mm -hmm. watch Hollywood movies. So um, not every week, but I would go a fair amount. That was okay. my treat. Okay. Um, but I mean, through this experience, I went to go do marketing, as I said, but I ended up working with kids again the same way I did in um, Benin. This time I was, uh, I ended up starting youth clubs as a way to teach um, people in the community tolerance and inclusion. Um, so I we work with the kids to do that. And then the kids became my voice in the community as a way to get people to support the Special Olympics athletes that were coming to this community. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, through those youth clubs, I got to know the youth in the community and understand sort of what their joys, their pains, their dreams, their goals, their challenges were. And so um I maintained, a, you know, after I left South Africa, I traveled around and the whole time then I'm still like praying and being like, okay, God, so what am I supposed to do? Um, and then also at the same time, every single person I met on these travels, um, I'm like, what's your purpose? How did you know this is your purpose? You know, and I'm also staying at backpackers. And so I'm meeting really interesting people that are leaving non-traditional lifestyle. So people that travel most of the time, I'm like, well, how do you do that? I want to do that. I don't want to go back to just being in office. Like, right. you know, and hearing all these different ways that people have developed to be able to live these very like nomadic lifestyles mm -hmm. um which really appealed to me because mind you um when i applied to get my mba i was like if i don't get in i'm gonna just be a gypsy that was my backup plan i don't know how it's gonna work out but that was the goal i was like i'll be a gypsy if i can't get in and get an mba yeah so i'm glad the mba thing worked out um <laughs> but uh, you know, through all of those conversations that I had while I was traveling and just the prayer and just the quiet time and meditation. I mean, and that trip was beautiful. I mean, I literally was going from like one day being, I spent my 31st birthday on the beach in Egypt. Um, you know, so I'd be one day like 
snorkeling in the now, you know, not in the now, in the Red Sea, or um, and then the next day, like I was in Vietnam or something. Not the next day, but you know, a couple days later, I'm in Vietnam, or you know, then I'm in Thailand or an elephant. You know, it was it was this again, like beyond my wildest dreams. I remember um, just being like, I can't believe this is my life. I can't believe. You know, I grew up in a single parent household, mm-hmm. little black girl from Maryland, and mm-hmm. you know, from a small town that is literally like just in a different country doing all these really cool things. Like it was awesome, like right. absolutely awesome. I like still to this day when I think about it and I look at the pictures, like I can't believe it, like <laughs> awesome. Um, and I'm I just like I just every day, thank you, thank you, thank you. But um, through that experience, when I got back to the States, I went back and I got another job at in the same sort of field in brand management that I was working before, but it's hard to go. Well, so, right. So, so when you moved back, did uh-huh. you go to, back to New York or did you? I went to North Jersey. So I worked for a company called Wreck at Ben Kieser. So they make like Lysol, okay. Nair, stuff like that. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. And I was working in the vitamin category. So, uh, yeah, I, it, you can't you can't go back from that. Like okay. you, you right. can't go back. Right. Um, and so you know, again, sort of at this point of like, yes, it's great. I and I for me, I just wanted to get to like the promotion and get the title and get a little bit more experience before I check. You know, before I left. Mm-hmm. But it's it's hard. Mm-hmm. Like, and I I mean, you know, um, while I was there, I started really thinking about, okay, like God had put it in my heart when I was in Benin to do something mm-hmm. to really close the gap between Africans and um, diasporans and bring them together to make sure on both sides they have a better understanding of each other. So I think we're in a different place culturally now as far as that's concerned. But, you know, when I was there 15 years ago mm-hmm. at my HBCU, I was getting teased for going to Africa and people were like, you're going to be so behind. Like, why would you ever go to Africa? Like, and, you know, making the, the, the <laughs> click noises and shit shooting you know very ignorant <laughs> stuff like from us mm-hmm. um and then you know same thing i get to africa you know i get to benin and people are like you're white and i'm like no i'm not well there's no black people in africa i mean i'm in america I'm like no 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 wow. or i mean and that's not everybody but i heard stuff like that or i definitely had to like explain that i wasn't that i wasn't white and that i was black well, 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 hold up. when they say you weren't you weren't black are they well, look they, at my skin color. Right. You're not the same color. As, look at your skin and color. Look at my skin color. Your hair is kind of like ours, but it's softer. So oh, you're you okay? Fine. You're not white. You're mixed. Oh, so okay. one of your parents is African and your other parent is white, and that's how you're American. Oh. You know, it was that kind of thing, and like always, or even it's funny because my mom came to visit, and she's you know the same color as me. And they're like, we told you you were white, and I was like, oh. no, <laughs> no. <laughs> um. But, you know, just that kind of stuff or just, you know, um, people asking you questions about black people. Because, you know, you have to, especially in that rural environment I was in in Benin, Mm -hmm. like, we're not there. We're not doing projects, like I said, like Peace Corps. Like, it's not in our culture. Like, I even remember when I quit my job, quit Campbell's to go do that trip around the world and somebody being like, what do you think? You're a white girl. Like, you know, this is a black person said this to me. Um, Mm -hmm. Somebody I went to undergrad with. But it's like, you know, for us. When we, it's like, you you know, we're taught, go get a job, you know, get your degree, go get a job. So just to take a year out. And I mean, and it's different now. It's more mm-hmm. accepted. You know, one of the Obama girls took a took a gap year. But right. for us, you know, especially you, either you, your family may not have the income for you to have the luxury of taking a year off mm-hmm. or, you know, you got other people depending on you or it's just not taught to us that that's a possibility. Right. So, um and you don't, back to my point about mentors, you don't have people that you see that are doing that, again, for you to know. So we don't, we're not there. They don't, you know, people aren't seeing us. We're not, you look at people who do international development, we are low in numbers and it is hard for us to get those jobs. Um, so, you know, it's, you see us on TV, but that's it. We're not the people, every time you meet an American, every time you meet a foreigner, they're white. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is like, oh, wait, so let me try to understand who you are. And again, it's, this was 15 years ago. It's different now. And I was in a very rural area, but, um, you know, and this was a lot of conversations with kids too, I should say, but, um, still, Mm -hmm. so I wanted to bring a, I wanted to start an organization to close that gap. I also wanted to start an organization to, um, give youth the opportunities to travel the way I had now had them and for it to open up their world the way it did for me like travel completely changed who I am and my perspective of myself even more so than my perspective of the world I feel like the more you grow the more you see the more you grow and it's just you know it's this like you know there's certain and um 
reptiles and lizards or things that if you put them in a, they only grow as big as their cage, certain sharks right. too. Right. So you put it in a small cage, it's only going to go so this big. And I feel that's what travel does. It makes your box, your cage bigger so you can grow bigger. So, so let me ask you this as far as travel is concerned. So being that you have done a lot of traveling, mm -hmm. how do you see America now? Oh, we're going there? Okay. <laughs> and, we'll, and, and we'll go back. We'll go back. We'll, we'll, we'll go back to your journey. Oh, but. that's such a loaded question. <laughs> Do I have to answer it? <laughs> um, I love America. It's home. Okay. Somebody asked me that when I was in South Africa recently. They're like, what's home? Mm -hmm. Home is home. Home is D.C. Like, um... I love, I love America. Like it's, it's me. I am. And I said, I think that's the thing. Like I refer to myself as black American more than African American right. because I, I am of this experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I, my experience is connected to the continent by ancestry, but I am of this experience and traveling to the continent. You quickly realize like, you know, from, well, at least my experience the first time was like, I re I didn't realize how American I was until I left America. Right. You know, I've, I've only really truly like waved an American flag or celebrated 4th of July with a patriotic sort of thought behind it when I was out of America. Right. You know, you all of a sudden there's this kinship. You see America, oh, you're from America. Where are you from? You know, and there's this kind of, I didn't have that until I left. So, mm -hmm. um, so I love America, but we have, oh, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting even from a technology perspective or from an infrastructure perspective. And it, it amazes me, you know, especially cause I live in South Africa, um, you know, which people only hear is Africa when you say it. Um, right. And so they're, oh, you live in Africa? Well, that must be hard. And you know, I'm like, <laughs> no, actually, I, I live a much better lifestyle in South Africa than I do here. You know, um, you know, small things like I think about, like, I was trying to, you know, to bank in South Africa, like it's fingerprints and signature cards and like, mm -hmm. or, you know, it's just, it's, it's much more heightened. Well, in South Africa, the, the security is tighter and they just much more like um, oversight mm -hmm. for other reasons. I was like, man, our stuff got all sorts of loopholes in it. Like I never realized it or like stuff like in my bank account in South Africa, I can transfer money to anybody okay. in any bank. Like, it's so easy like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why can't I do that? We're just getting to the point. Yeah. We're just getting to the point where you can pay at your table for stuff. Yeah. So, like, when you pay there and in a lot of places in Europe, they don't take your card away. They, and they, so you put the tip in right then mm -hmm. and they just swipe your card once. So why do you take my card away, swipe my card, come back, I write something to tip down on it, and then at the end of the night, you reconcile it. Right. So, I mean, those are just very small examples I can think of, but there's so many ways where we're actually behind the curve wow. as far as technology or infrastructure, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't, we think we are like the end all be all in the, like we're here. Right. And so it's very interesting when you get outside of America and you actually get to see some of the areas where we're behind. So we're great in a lot of stuff. And I think actually the biggest thing we export right now is just, our brand and sort of our marketing through our through our entertainment industry so um it's you when you leave i think for me what i've realized is how much hype was in that and i also realized how much propaganda is in our messaging like you sit and you watch movies so i i love movies and i watch a lot of movies and you just realize like wow we really pushed this whole america is the greatest thing in our movies and you don't really i was i didn't see it as much or really question it until like I got out of the country and I'm looking at it. I was like, why are there so many American flags in the back of our movies? Why are these soldiers from the States coming in? Weren't they here? Then why are Americans coming here to save these people when the characters weren't even, you know, mm -hmm. just silly things. Like you start noticing like the villain always has like this accent and versus the pe yeah. good people, you know. And so I, at least for me, I wasn't at that low. I didn't, wasn't as cognizant of some of that stuff until I really looked at it from the outside in. So okay. Again, I, I don't know, I love, and I think this day and age, oh, it's hard being an American. Like, I went through the Bush era traveling and being American and people just laughing at you. I even remember when people laughed at us during the uh, Monica Lewinsky scandal, but now, like, trying to answer questions to people and explain what's going on and like, how did y'all vote for this? I didn't vote. I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, so, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a, I think, you know what, I, I think it was... Um, Oh, I can't even think of his name right now. I, there, there's a quote from, um, I, oh, I can't think of his name. But anyhow, just about when you're conscious mm -hmm. 
as a Negro in America, it is just a very conflicted place to be. You love her, but then at the same time, that's why you have to like, qu you question her that much more for who she is and what she is. So the way, when I start looking at how I get, I get treated as a black person so much better outside of America. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I think also when we talk about freedom, mm -hmm. My freedom, even South Africa has serious like security, you know, like the crime is real in South Africa, really? but the, my, the, I feel so much freer there than I do here in a lot of ways. And so there, there's some of those nuanced things that you, you come back here. Like I didn't realize how militarized or um, just how much of a police state we are mm -hmm. and, and until like I lived overseas. So like, you know, for instance, in South Africa, I drive however fast I want to. Nobody, there's not really a lot of like, you know, control over that. And I really, and I was, or like, you know, I drive, I don't have to drive with a seatbelt on. And it's so interesting when people get in my car, I'm always like, put a seatbelt on, put a seatbelt on, because we're so used to like, well, you're gonna get a ticket if you don't put a seatbelt on. And so, you know, or, you know, you're gonna, the, you know, you're so used to like looking for cops when you drive. And so, those little things made me realize like, oh, I only do this because I'm used to being punished for it. Right. And in America, they punish you if you don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this. And we behave a certain way mm -hmm. because if we don't, there's always, there's consequences for so much things. So part of me right. started thinking like, but is that freedom? <laughs> like when we talk about freedom, so here I can, there's certain things that I can do and no, like... I'm not going to get in trouble if I drop something on the ground and litter. So, yes, I don't want to live in an environment where it's dirty, but nobody's right. going to find me $50 for doing it. Right. I don't know. So, that's a lot, but there's your answer. Okay. So, and that was a great answer, too, by the way. <clears throat> um, so, right. So, now let's get, let's get to your organization that you're, that, that, that you're working on in South Africa. So, um, could, could you break that down to us from the beginning? until where it is now. Yeah, so, um, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, because you let me skip through some stuff that, that's good. Um, <laughs> so, in 2015, um, well, let me take a step back. I So, you know, I went back um, to my community and I had a conversation. I, I, I live in a kingdom and I had the conversation with the king um, about some of the challenges that they were facing with youth there. Um, and a lot of it just comes down to unemployment. So there's South Africa has a 50 percent roughly give or take, just depending on where we're at, mm -hmm. um, youth unemployment rate. And so because so many of the youth are unemployed and most of them, you know, have at least a high school degree, um, some may even have some sort of tertiary education. Mm -hmm. They're just sitting at home and doing nothing. They're bored. They're just and, and they want to do and they just don't know how to do. So that ends up them getting in trouble. And some of that stuff is also why you have sort of the crime mm -hmm. statistics you have in South Africa. Um, so anyhow, with that said, you know, um, I was talking to the king. He's like, we need, you know, wanting to do something about this in sort of um, you know, they try different things. So I kind of came home and I came back and I was like, well, here's a proposal. What do you think? And um, so people, I talked to people in the community and they said, well, okay, you can pilot it. You can try it. And so my, one of my thoughts was, um, and I, I did a lot of research into youth unemployment and what caused it and sort of came up with this model to be able to address some of those issues. And for me, I really wanted to address the issue and intervene before people became employed versus working with people once they became unemployed. Um, and so, you know, also in South Africa, 50% of the kids drop out of high school between like ninth and 10th grade. Okay. Um, so I wanted to do something and, you know, talking to people here as well that were in education where let's get them before all these issues that they encounter as, you know, adolescent youth um, start to happen so we can keep them in school and then also give them the skills they need to be able to pursue their goals on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in addition to that, sort of to what I said earlier, I really wanted it something that kind of brought youth together across the continent um, or across the diaspora. Um, so we piloted the program starting in 2015. It is a four year program where, again, we start with the youth in grade eight and we stay with them till grade 11. Um, so the the first part of the program is um, really about them getting a better understanding of who they are and what they want to do, getting them to believe in themselves and just um, just, just truly have a sense of self. And then what we've also added in there through the, through the pilot is a sense of the community of where they come from and just pride in all aspects of who you are and what makes you. Then from there, um, now that you know who you are, we take you outside of your community and expose you to the world beyond. Um, so that way you can have a better understanding of who you can be. So that is 
through learning excursions. That is through, we have like a career conference in grade 10 because that's when the kids are picking their class, or sorry, in grade nine because that's when they're about to pick their classes um, for grade 10. Um, and we bring in people from all over to talk to them uh, um, to just, you know, the fact that there's an American working in this program and people, mentors that come in. So now that you know who you are and you know sort of who you want to be, then now we work on, we use entrepreneurship as a tool to teach you how to create what you want for yourself and to own it. So um, the culminating and the capstone project in the organization is for the kids to go on a trip. And so we teach them the basics of entrepreneurship or business. And then from there, they apply it by doing fundraisers to be able to go on this trip. So they have to raise a third of the cost. Um, they put together the budget, they research where they want to go. And then through that, um, and through other experiences they have throughout the program, they're able to get some of the core skills that you need to be successful in life. So whether that's teamwork, whether it's you know, conflict resolution, just, you know, being able to um, accept failure and not crumble from it. Um, you know, being able to talk to adults, you know, you, especially in cultures where, you know, it's very hierarchical. Um, and so like as a kid, you know, I'm not looking at an adult in the eye um, as, you know, so being able to be okay and being to like address an adult and, and ask and present things and not being nervous or, you know, even in sort of like in South Africa, being okay with talking to somebody who isn't the same skin color as you right. and that not making you nervous um, all of a sudden because, you know, you're um, a little black girl who's grown up in a rural environment and now you've got a white guy in front of you that you need to ask a question to mm -hmm. so that you're not intimidated by that based on your gender or your race. Um, so anyhow, just getting those them those kind of experiences that then they can use for anything else in life. Um, and so we just finished piloting the program um, in South Africa. Um, we just actually literally in October, the results were phenomenal, oh, yeah. like surpassed my wildest expectation. Um, and through the, through the pilot, we also partnered with organizations here in the States. So we were able to do some of those cross-cultural exchange experiences, even in the pilot. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, now we're working on launching the project full scale. Um, so I am moving to South Africa in April. And uh, then from there, we are going to be recruiting and training youth out of school, um, mm -hmm. unemployed youth out of school in the community to be able to run the program for us. We're also getting a facility in South Africa to be able to house the program. And then we'll be launching it full scale in South Africa in 2020 in the seven high schools or seven, eight high schools that are in my community. Mm -hmm. um, and then in addition to that, we're partnering with the organization in Ghana. And then also I'm working on identifying a partner here in the DC area. That So that way we can run the program simultaneously in all those areas and the kids will be working together um, through a virtual classroom. Yeah. So, so, right. So you're saying you're moving to South Africa. So, yeah, bro. Yeah. So, so you're saying that you're leaving America and you're uh, totally moving to South Africa. So for the last, what, three and a half, four years of this pilot, I've been living between South Africa and D.C. So I have an apartment already. Um, okay. um, I always, uh, my goal, my new goal in my like retired goals is to be tri-continental. So I'm already bi-continental, right. um, which is crazy to me. I'm like, what? That's so cool. Um, <laughs> so, so, so what is going to be the tri? Um, someplace with a beach. Uh, so I'm, I don't know. I haven't picked Cuba would be sexy. That would be awesome. So someplace with a beach, I can just go from a tree house and go and walk onto the beach. So I don't know. That's the goal. But for right now, so I've been living between South Africa already. So my, I'm, I'm really just inverting that. So probably like I'll still spend about three months of the year in the States. I'm going to keep my house, but my base will be in South Africa. Um, and I'll be, my goal is sort of be there for three years and then go to the next community and then start I Am We Are there. So my, my, the goal is to be able to train people so that it is locally run completely and I don't have to be there to do it, mm -hmm. but I need to be there to kind of, because what really is unique and what makes the organization is the culture. It's such, it's a nurturing environment. It's a caring environment. It's an environment where the kids feel comfortable. The kids have a voice where they feel empowered. And I need to make sure those, some of those elements and how we maintain those elements are, are some of those elements in um, how they manifest themselves are maintained throughout every launch, because it's not really the curriculum. It's the curriculum is one thing, but it's that feeling, that energy that needs to stay within. So three years in South Africa, then three years somewhere else, and then three years somewhere else, right. and then we'll grow the organization that way.
Okay. Um, so, is there anything else you would like to say? Oh, just in general now? Sure. Um. Any, any message to the youth or, or, or <laughs> do you have any, anything to say? Well, I mean, that's, that's a lot. So, I think, one, let me just plug. So, if yes. anybody wants to learn more about um, I Am We Are, mm -hmm. they can go to our website, which is IamWeAreYouth.org. Mm -hmm. um, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at I Am We Are Youth. Um, so I just encourage anybody that's interested in learning more about the organization, wants to volunteer, if you want to donate, we'll always take your dollars. Um, they go further in South Africa. Um, or just send books. We all, we need books and arts and craft supplies, you know, oh, we need all of that. Feel free to contact us. We also have done a documentary, which is called I Am Because We Are. So we're about to embark on a 10 city tour across the U.S. to be able to share the documentary and the work that's going on. So there's information about the documentary on the website, but we will be coming to Philadelphia, D.C., New York, Atlanta, Charlotte, Chicago, New Orleans, Seattle, L.A., um, and Dallas. Um, with that tour. So um, definitely, if you're in one of those cities, please look us up. We'd love to have you um, answer any other questions you have. I would say after that, um, hmm. I mean, I, mean, I, I got a couple things. Okay, what? Go ahead. Were you no, going to no, say no, something? I, I just was going to say because you have done a lot. Have I? Like, within uh, maybe a short period of time. I don't I'm know. 40 now. Okay, right. I'll right. be 41 next month. Okay. Within a within a certain period of time, you have done a lot. Uh -huh. So, and I'm sure when people hear this, especially kids and especially uh, young black kids, um, what what would you say to them as uh -huh. far as their direction and and where they're trying to go? Okay, I don't even know how many points this is, but after we do this today, I'm going to have it for the next time, and it's going to be like a thing. Okay. So you're going to create this like first time hearing it now. <laughs> um, okay, the first, so my big lesson for this week is that you live at the level of according to your own faith. So what I've learned throughout this journey um, is if you believe struggle, strive, challenge, etc., is your is what you're supposed to be experiencing or what is going to happen, that's what's going to happen. Um, I believe at this point in my life, I like my little mantra is that I am, this is my season of love, increase, abundance, and overflow. Like it feels good every time I say that. But um, I believe that I'm living that, I'm living that sort of in my steps and in my belief system. And so I am living that in my reality, yeah. if that makes sense. So, um, you know, I, I literally quit a job. I guess that's if you heard this is a trend now of things I do. But anyway, I quit my current job on Monday without having knowing where the replacement in that income was going to come from. I just knew that at this point, like, you know, it's all too much. Like, you know, I'm in South Africa working virtually still for the States up till like four o'clock in the morning and then like getting up at like seven, and, you know, doing this stuff with the kids is, is too much. And I'm like, I need to and I need to just we're at a point now where we need to grow. So and I got this tour. So. I left, I quit my job on Monday, not knowing where the income is. And today is Friday and I already started a new consulting job and I'm actually making like double the salary, um, abundance, an increase. That's what I said, right? I'm making double the salary and I'll be able to work less time. And you know, I got a new Airbnb person coming in and the money's hitting right. So all of it, it's coming as I said it would, because that's what I believe when I believed earlier that like. Okay, if I'm making these sacrifices, I'm an entrepreneur. Like, okay, there's going to be struggle that's going to come with it, and it's not going to be okay. I'm, I'm probably not going to have enough money. That was my reality. Like, I sat, you know, I, I, I sat for like two years this experience with financial hardship, and then, but because that's what I thought was part of this journey, because that's what you kind of hear about. Like, that's what you have to accept, and so that's what I lived out. But I don't believe that anymore. So that's not my reality. Uh, it's coming like in abundance. So that's the first one. Like, you believe, live at the level of your faith. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think along with that, the other thing that I just really learned, it hit me hard this week is when you open the door to new, when you open the door to new possibilities, that's when they're created. So, you know, in quitting my job and taking that stuff of faith, 
Mm-hmm. I open the door for new possibilities to then come into my faith and come into my life. And so you again, you 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 live out what you create and what you believe. So if I believe possibilities are coming, I create those new possibilities, they will. But if you don't create the opportunity for new possibilities to be a reality in your life, it's not going to happen. Gotcha. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. So that that's that's two. Um but I think it also just comes down to a lot of my journey comes down to faith. And so, like, people ask me, like, well, how did you do this? Or how did you pay for the last three years? Or how are you living? And I'm like, well, that's God. Like, you know, I haven't, I haven't actively sought out a job or a financial sort of thing in, like, four years. And people call me and they're like, hey. And, and, I, and that's just very honest. So I can sit here and tell you, like, okay, I did this and I did this and I did this. And this came from this. Or even the money to be able to find that, that first trip I took for I and we are to the most current trip. I can tell you literally where the money came from, but when I really boil it down, it is nothing but grace. And that's also for me, my confirmation of like, this work is my ministry. Mm -hmm. And like when I said, I surrender and God, what you, what are you going to do? Like, it is amazing to see what he had to do. And so I think the next part of that whole thing. So, you know, let's go with number four now. (laughs) Um, I'll clean this up the next time I share. But I mean. Oh my gosh, what I've learned through this experience is just the power of obedience and surrender. And so, you know, I when I was talking about just sort of the results and the impact that this program has had, um, it's it's sort of, I don't know, trifold. So I think, one, I see how the kids are different. I see it because, you know, I've been with them for four years. I can see it through the surveys and the M&E tools that we use. Mm-hmm. I see it through what they tell me, what their parents tell me, how people in the community see them. They're like, oh, these kids are different. They're well Oh, these kids, you know, right. everybody that interacts with them. Um, I see it. I hear it. Um, I feel it. Mm-hmm. But then, so that's just the kids are different. And that's from me being obedient and taking a risk and starting this organization. Um, I can see, because I believe like ripples create waves. Um, and so I can see my ripples starting to take place. Like there was a youth um, last year from the community. He's like in his early 20s. He's a teacher, is in like video, does um, camera work, video work, mm-hmm. uh, study drama. So he's a drama teacher. And I did a film festival last year. So, well, first, a friend of mine's friend wanted to come to South Africa. So I was like, cool, we'll come. She does film work. Cool. We want to teach the kids how to make films. Mm-hmm. She did that. And then I was like, you know what? You need to bring your kids back from Philly here. We're going to take this film that you did and we're going to do a whole film festival out of it. Mm-hmm. And it, and it grew to this thing. So then she came back the next year. She was like, she didn't know how she was going to do it. And the same thing, I, th- I was like, nah, just have faith. It's going to work out. I'll see you in six months uh-huh. back here with your kids. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's going to work out. I'll see you soon. So she came back and she had kids with her. And we had a whole film festival. Not just, and we rented out a whole, like a mo- in a, a, a screen in a movie theater. And we went to a proper movie theater. The kids got to see movies they made on a big, kids had never been to a movie theater before. Uh-huh. Saw themselves on the big screen. And, you know, got to see these movies that they made. I'm in a movie, I made a movie, and I'm at a movie theater. Right? right? It was that kind of experience. So anyhow, from that, um, we had a local school, that the school where this guy taught, mm-hmm. they entered a film. Um, Noella from Philly, popping. Um, she spoke to him and said, you should enter into our film festival. It was awesome. He did. They got accepted. And so this summer, I was in Philly with, you know, this guy I know from my community in South Africa with his film. And I mean, his first time out of America and just seeing how he how that experience like impacted him from one getting to live out this dream to being at this film festival and seeing he, you know, he saw like something like, okay, well, we can do this and we can do more films. And now they're like back in South Africa producing films like this. They're working with other schools to produce films. We're we we're going to take this film festival. We're going to make it bigger. But that was all again from this, this the ripples. Yeah. Like so, I didn't pay for his trip. I didn't technically get him to South Africa, but because I was obedient and I did the work and I brought the people and you know Noella did this, right. it, it, the ripples are happening. So I'm seeing. I got multiple stories like that that I can tell of like how this work has affected other people. You know, from the my friends that have come out to South Africa to the work that they you know so much. So. Mm-hmm. I can see the the, the, the the ripples and how they're going, but I also, I think the third, and so is also how I'm changed. I am, I feel like I was like a girl, like a scared young girl when I started this work just three or four years ago. Like, so maybe in numbers I wasn't, but I, that, that scared little young girl who was inside of me was the person who was sort of ruling me. And now I am the woman that I am meant to be and destined to be. And 
God has just worked on me so much through this work and just healing and just shedding, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And like when he first showed me the vision for what I am, we are supposed to be. I was just, I can't do this. Like I, I'm flawed in this way. I'm, I, I experienced this. This is bad, blah, blah, blah. I'm not this. And now I look at that and I'm like, cool, we got this. Let's do it. <laughs> like, and it's like, I, it, it, I'm such a different person now. And I can, the woman who God showed me four years ago, I don't need, I'm not fully her, but I'm walking into her now and I'm confidently walking into her and owning her. And that feels great. So this work has changed me. And that is all the power of surrendering. And that is the power of a obedience um so i think that and i think that just the other thing is just like don't listen to the naysayers mm -hmm. i always say you can't tell square people about circle ideas because they're not going to get it mm -hmm. um so you know to those square people like let them live in their box and you go live outside of your box like be the round person live in the world be the world um and so whether that is like to the little black girl and little black boy who somebody and i experienced it a lot more now kind of in south africa that somebody's telling you this is what you can or can't do because you're black mm -hmm. like you know what I, don't listen to them you can do anything you want to and your race your gender um you know your sexuality does not prohibit you from doing anything or predestine you to doing anything in some regards um and then with that said as well, like, you know, when I, I, you know, now at this point, everybody's kind of used to me quitting jobs, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, when I left that first job at Campbell's, you know, people were like, that's crazy. Like you make this amount of money, you live this lifestyle. Why would you do that? Like you've got this degree, et cetera. Um, and you know, but that one, that's not my, that's not my, my level. That's not what excellence to me is. Like I can get behind, like you've, you've stopped, you've made a ceiling on what your life can be. Mm -hmm. But I think with that said though, um, that was what success looked like for them too. Like this, that wasn't for me. And so people are well-intentioned, especially maybe even your family members, and they will try to protect you and keep you safe and keep you from doing things. Um, but I mean, I just am like, don't listen to the naysayers. And so for me, like as a person of faith, you know, I always go back to that story of Peter walking on water. And mm -hmm. I remember my minister preaching to it about the boat people. So the boat people, like Peter was walking on the water and he was good when he was listening to Jesus and following Jesus and looking at Jesus. And he was like, boom, I'm focused. And as soon as he turned his eyes and heart and ears away from Jesus to listen to those people in the boat mm -hmm. and the people in the boat were like, come back, Peter, and do this. Peter, not nah, Peter, come on, you can be saying, well, it's the ghost out there what are you doing that's when he started sinking mm. and so the boat people when you step outside the boat you challenge their comfort zones and so now and then they also they just want to keep you safe so they're trying to keep you safe they want to protect you so they want you to come back in they don't want you to sink mm -hmm. but in this and then also at the same time by you getting out the boat you've challenged sort of their comfort level in the boat as well but if i keep my eyes my heart my head my you know on jesus it's me and him i'm gonna keep flaying the float mm -hmm. and i mean even if i may sink a little bit i know he got me right and so that's just that's when i can't listen to the nation like this is like you can't expect anybody else to understand the vision that and the dreams and the goals that god has given you so when they don't understand and they think you're crazy you're like okay that's cool thank you mm -hmm. and, and keep on going like you know and you know and not to say that people don't can't give you good feedback to help you move your dream but i can't like I just, I always tell my, I joke with my friend, I'm like, just sit down and let me build my boat. Like, you know, like Noah, like, that's great. I don't care if you don't think there's a flood going, but I'm going to build my boat and I'm be good and love me either. If the boat, if the flood happens, you welcome to get on this boat with me. If it don't happen, I know y'all been calling me crazy for the last couple years, but just love me anyway, you know? Right. So let me be crazy. Let me build my boat and, and I'm going to float and I'm going to be okay. Nice. So that's it. Nice. Was that, how many facts was that? That five, six? I don't know. We go with I that. I think that was number five. Okay. All right. Five things. So that's it. That was good. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, letting us hear your journey. It's, it, it, was, <laughs> it was amazing to hear. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to hear more stories uh, coming soon from you. Yes. www.iamweareyouth.org on social media at I Am We Are Youth. And check us out in... A city near you with our documentary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right.